Good morning, and once again, welcome to the first annual Great Oregon Home Built Fly-In. Thank you so much for being here with us this morning. We're very excited to introduce to you one of our newest displays and the dedication thereof, the RV3, one of the first kits available from the RV line back in 1971. We are accepting this formally into the museum as our newest exhibit from EAA 31, who did a three-year restoration to static display on this aircraft, which you'll hear about in just a little bit, from project manager Gary Lubicki. This aircraft is an important and quintessential piece to the Oregon lineage here at the museum. We're very excited to have it with us to complete the circle of aviation. Um, Today, out here out front, we have the Baby Fleet, which is one of the very first home built in Lane County. Um, followed by the Story Special Number 2, which is a 1940s home built. Um, followed up by the RV3. So we're very happy to have it here in the collection. I'm also very honored to introduce to you today the designer and builder of the RVs, Mr. Richard Van Brunsman. Thank you. Where do I start? It goes back a, a long ways. I'm um, not primarily an aviation historian, uh, maybe by chance or by accident. I've got more involved in that. Um, going back far prior to the RV3 or Vans aircraft, I uh, was introduced to aviation at least passively at, at a young age. Is, um, my father had learned to fly back in the mid 1930s. The farm, or grandfather's farm, was only about three miles from the field where Les Long had built this airplane and the later um, Parasol Longster and the later Low Wing Wimpy, which I believe is being restored in this collection now. Dad had been bitten by the aviation bug, as so many young people had in the, the Lindbergh era. I think he was, oh, I forget, let's see, what, 12 years old or so at the time Lindbergh flew the Atlantic. So, I mean, this was just something that everybody, every young person was enthused about. So when uh, Longs opened a little field on their farm, Dad would hang around there, and he was, um, a young man at the time, and uh, during the Depression, finding enough money to fly, he said he was making 10 cents an hour doing farm work, and flight instruction was $4 an hour, so do the math. <laughs> but he did solo in the um, uh, American Eagle that they had as a trainer there, and something like four hours of duel from Ed Ball, who's a historic figure himself, and had learned to fly at the uh, Tex Rankin School of Flight in Portland. So all definitely names that you recognize. So um, anyway, like I say, Dad had, had soloed after four hours, and <laughs> which seems really strange now with the structured uh, flight training programs we have. They immediately put him in the single seat parasol longster to fly. What kind of a check out is that with four hours of total time in your belt now stepping into a, a single seat airplane. And he flew that a little until he kind of ran out of money and about the time he was to get married, he figured he couldn't really do both so aviation came to a stop. But that said, these were stories I heard in my childhood so I knew about home-built airplanes, even in you know the late 40s, early 50s, when home-builts were almost not heard of at all in the country. So when EIA was first formed, um, and I could read what was published about it in various aviation magazines, of course, was immediately interested. By that time, I was in my mid-teens, getting to the point that um, would soon be old enough to fly. Uh, There's always a, you know, for, some, for whatever reason, the fascination with building and flying something you've built. 
living on a farm, we did a lot of building and repairing and what have you. So uh, um, the, the idea of constructing things was just kind of second nature almost. So particularly if it was an airplane, uh, to, to build it would be the ideal way to go about it. A lot of the early home builds when EIA was first formed were not really that exceptional. The high performance, etc. cetera, you know, the Baby A's, the Pete and Paul, were very mediocre airplanes, but they still had some fascination just for those of us that were intrigued with the idea of building your own. Chapter 31 was formed in Eugene in um, mid-50s, and um, I attended maybe the organizational meeting for that. We had a, a, in our family at the time, we had a Taylor Craft BC-12, and I flew that down to Eugene when I was 16 years old to uh, attend the meetings. And for about a year, I think I attended almost every meeting until it got to be a, a bit of a hassle. And, uh, and I realized that most of the people in the chapter were talkers rather than doers. But <laughs> pardon my opinion of that. Uh, obviously, when you're 16 years old, uh, you can get pretty excited about the, the projections that people make about what they're going to do and all of the airplanes they're building. Anyway, pardon me for, for um, going on and on here, but I've uh, obviously um, got a connection to Oregon aviation history. Um, beyond, besides that, besides the, um, the fact that my dad had learned to fly out at Long's Field, um, had an uncle, um, was not an uncle at that time, but um, he had owned the um, Rupert Special. I'm not sure of the years, the, during the war years, I believe, and it rebuilt that. And flown it out of uh, the small farm field out near Bethany, which is now the city. <laughs> but uh, so, uh, had more exposure to home built airplanes just by by um, through relatives than definitely most people. Anyway, back to the RB3, uh, this all came about. Um, had um, made a friend during my college years who lived out by Sandy, Oregon, a fellow named George Fogartis, also a name that many of you recognize because of the connection that he had with home-built aircraft. And, as president of the American Airmen's Association, prior to my knowing him or knowing of him, that made his historic trips to Washington to convince the CAA that there should be a licensing for home-built or experimental aircraft. So I visited George a number of times, um, I could fly my Taylor craft into his little farm strip out near Sandy and visit with him and learn what I could about uh, his past and, and um, goings on. And he passed on a lot more information about Les Long and the other people that he had uh, known. So when I first had a chance uh, to have an airplane of my own, I was uh, um, in the early 1960s in the US Air Force stationed in Michigan and went out shopping for a used airplanes, used home builds. I managed to buy a Stitz Playboy. And uh, at the time, the Playboy was about as popular as RVs are now. Uh, many people, there are not that many of them around anymore, but it was just about the leading home built because it was a low wing, kind of sexy looking, didn't really perform that well, but it looked nice. So. Uh, Bought one that was really pretty sad, and flew it for a couple years. Bought another airplane that was um, uh, dismantled at the time and rebuilt that. Put a bigger engine, 125 light homing in it, and flew that in 1964, I think. And after I um, left the service, came home in 1964, uh, brought that airplane back to Oregon. Within a year or so, I had modified it and uh, designed a set of cantilever aluminum wings to replace.
replace the strut braced wood fabric wings that the Playboy had. That then became the RB1. Uh, still the same uh, 125 horse light homing, but with the different wings and some other uh, changes in wing location, angle of incidence, etc., it became a dramatically better airplane. So uh, flew the RV-1 until 1968, I believe, when some airline captain down in Texas wanted it bad enough to offer me $3,750, which was big money at the time. So I sold it to him because I knew I could do better. I wanted to replace it with a, an upgraded, uh, original design version, which became the RV-3. The wing is very similar in overall size, uh, airfoil, etc. do what the Stitz Playboy had. If you took a plan form of one and overlaid the other, it would be very close to an RV-3. So was it really an RV-3 or, a, pardon me, an original design, or was it a copy? Uh, you come to your own conclusions there. Almost every airplane evolves from something else in concept, if not in direct lineage. Mainly, though, was able to learn and make improvements so that by the time we had the RV-3 flying, it was a um, quite high-performance airplane. And that had kind of been my goal um, that coming from my background of um, flying from a short farm strip, etc., I definitely wanted an airplane that had utility, broad enough performance to be able to do that kind of uh, practical flying in addition to being fast and aerobatic. So had all of those qualities and uh, 1973 offered plans and some preformed parts for the airplane, not complete kits, because at that time an aircraft kit was almost unheard of. We really didn't have the industry that has evolved since. But things were uh, changing quickly, and uh, home builds were becoming more popular. People um, wanted more complete packages. Uh, at that time, normally a kit consisted of a package of raw materials, not really uh, prefabricated or foreign parts. That's what obviously people wanted. It made more sense. That has evolved into the very um, complete uh, prefab kits that we now have. Um, anyway, from there on, I think most of you are probably more familiar with what's happened um, in the evolution of the RV series of airplanes following that, the RV-3, rather than preceding it. Um, Single-place airplanes are great, except that they only have one seat. And obviously people um, wanted to share that type of flying with a passenger. So uh, over a period of years, we developed the RV-4 based on what we had learned from the three. It is not a two-seat RV-3. It was um, re uh, from scratch, redesigned, borrowing what we knew worked. And um, the RV-4 wasn't introduced until about 81, I believe. It took a couple of years to get the kit developed, and then it uh, did very well. It, it exceeded the RV-3 in sales by a, a dramatic margin. And of course, then that was a tandem airplane, so people wanted side-by-side -side seating. And it took a while to convince ourselves that that was a good idea. So I think about 86 came out with the RV-6. And then uh, the 20 gear uh, was added to it. Uh, and later, the RV-4 was, in a sense, upgraded to the 8, uh, a little bigger, uh, more utilitarian tandem. And it's, it's gone on from there. The main thing that has remained the same is our philosophy, and that is that we're making airplanes that are practical, at least within the field of sport airplanes, and um, uh, buildable, af 
affordable, uh, etc. That's um, the, the, the philosophy that we started with and that we've maintained. Uh, obviously, we've been pretty successful. We've had a lot of help from well, all of the, the builders that have been loyal to us and, and uh, that appreciated that concept, that package uh, that um, we're able to offer. Um, beyond that, um, I know everybody wants to know where are we going, what is the future? Uh, probably a, a lot the same, at least philosophically. We'll continue to upgrade the airplanes we have, to develop uh, new airplanes that fit whatever mission the market uh, seems to uh, command at the time, and um, continue to innovate as, as much as possible to provide airplanes that will keep people enthused and in the air. One of the things that we've been able to achieve that maybe doesn't get enough attention, and that is a relative high level of safety that has been achieved, um, in re particularly in recent years, by the fleet of RV aircraft and pilots. Home-built airplanes have not had a great history um, when it comes to accident statistics. And I think that's somewhat predictable just because of the nature of a lot of the earlier home-built airplanes that were original designs that didn't have a lot of um, technical expertise behind them. Um, training has been a, a big factor, particularly in single-seat airplanes. How do you really get training to fly a baby fleet or whatever? You don't. And obviously, statistics have kind of shown that um, that's not the best way to go about achieving safe flight. Within the RV community, and well, actually over the last 20 years or more, there's been training programs available uh, initially uh, and, and continuing by Mike Sager up at uh, Vernonia, Oregon, who has trained literally thousands of pilots to fly their RVs, and other people around the country that, that have, have done this. And the statistics are definitely uh, in in the favor are, are showing the, the RVs are, um, as far as we can tell, at a safety um, track right now, very similar to typical general aviation, aviation airplanes. And we'd like to say, well, why can't they be better? Well, they probably can, but just achieving that level over um, the, the, the lesser, uh, commendable performance of home builds over the years. This is a real achievement and it's a credit to all of the RV pilots that have stepped up and taken the training, admitted that they could benefit from more training and end up uh, flying much more safely than historically home builds have been able to. It, it's really something that we need to highlight and try and propagate a little more throughout the entire home built community, not just the RV community. I use the word community because that's an important uh, term. Uh, community or, or culture. Culture can be either good or bad. What I'm referring to here in the RV culture has been typically pretty positive. It's led to improved safety, People fly more professionally, and professionally in the sense of, of um, quality rather than professionally from the sense of being paid to do it. Uh, so it's, it's really an attitude that, that uh, people have done this, and we have, um, uh, to a degree, uh, I like to use the word peer influence rather than peer pressure. If pressure is necessary, get people to train and fly better, well, so be it. I think influence is, is a lot better, though, when you can set a good example that influences other people to do the right thing. So this is what we need to, to spread, the, the broaden the, the, the um, 
positivity that um, RV community has more broadly through the entire home built community. Not to say that the RV community is the only positive um, force, but um, uh, again, statistics show that. Um, the, um, the RV's safety record is now currently running about four times better than home builds in general. And some of the home builds, unfortunately, those that are in lesser number, the older airplanes, those that aren't supported by a good factory structure, um, just not doing as well, and I think we can understand why. You don't really have the the uh, communication of, of knowledge, the uh, availability of training, etc., to fly as um, safely as the RV have been able to. So really the challenge there then is to try and work together to establish the, the best community as possible, whether it be an EIA chapter, just airport groups that um, uh, talk to and, and influence each other, and, and definitely keep um, the positive aspects of aviation in the forefront rather than the uh, gee whiz, look what I can do approach to flying. So uh, I, th I think that we've, we've definitely shown that it can be done. We can definitely fly safer and more enjoyably. We just need to spread the message further. I think I've talked way more than they want me to but I wanted to get that word in because it, it's really something that we're all a part of. And um, uh, even though, like I said, we've, we've achieved this, we've shown that through better training, transition training, that we can fly a lot more safely. It's not the end of the road. It's a continuing process. It's something that we, both personally and as a group, have to continue to work on and uh, therein is the challenge, so uh, I'm sure that you will all uh, rise to that and uh, you know, keep flying as enjoyably and safely as possible. Thank you for inviting me here. on the RV-3, who will give you a little bit of backstory about the Aircraft Heroes Museum. Gary Ludicky. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hey, I, I have a, an RV-6A that I built. It's, it's the red, white, and blue one that's sitting, sitting out here. It took me nine years to build it. It's one of those things that uh, if I had a known what I was going to get involved in, uh, how long it would have taken, I wouldn't have started. But when I got to the other end of it, I was glad I did. And uh, it's been flying since uh, 2001, and it's got a little over 1,500 hours on it, and it's been all over the country. And I absolutely just love it, and I continue, I'll figure I'll fly that airplane until I've got to hang up the headset. The one interesting thing to me about it, one of the interesting things, is in building, I, I had come, since 1974, we have basically, uh, Sandy and I, my wife, have uh, almost continuously always owned an airplane. And they've uh, been a succession of Pipers and, and Cessnas, mostly. And when I decided to build, I, one of the stated reasons was, well, I'm tired of flying something that everybody else flies. You know, I want to build something that's unique, so I'm going to build an experimental. Well, as a lot of you may know, uh, Vans Aircraft, there are now more than 10,000 flying RVs. So uh, I come across, uh, you'll be talking to people and they say, uh, you know, Oh, you uh, you have your own airplane, and I said, yes. Uh, what you know? What is it? I said, well, it's a it's an experimental. It's a, a kit plane that I that I built, and they say, oh, is it an RV? And I mean, we're talking people that are not flyers or aviation people. And 
And I said, oh, you know about RVs? And they said, oh yeah, my, my neighbor built one or my, my brother built one or, or, or something. It's many, many, many people know of RVs and I'm very pleased to, to have mine. Well, uh, back about four years ago, uh, I was the president of Chapter 31 in Cresswell and uh, museum president, Dunk Kindred here, uh, came to me and said, would the chapter be willing to take on restoring an RV-3 to be used as a, as a van's aircraft exhibit at the museum? And I said, well, sure, we, we'd do that. And I came down and I looked at, at what had been donated, and the airplane had been in a, in a, um, a minor accident but it, it had damage and it wasn't all there. But I said, sure, we, we can do that. And we, we did it up at our chapter clubhouse. And by doing it up there, we ended up, I, I, don't, I don't know what a better alternative would have been at the time, but it took over three years to get it done. It's something that initially I thought, oh, we can do this in six months. Well, uh, one of the things, we didn't have a lot of room in the clubhouse because it's also used for club activities. And we didn't have uh, tools and things. Uh, so those of us that were working on it, we made lots of trips back and forth to our hangers and, you know, hey, do you have a such and such, you know, and, and all that. But perseverance paid off. Uh, and by the way, I, I saw a sign at one point when I was building. So it took me nine years to build to build mine, 92, or 93 to 2001, basically. Um, and the sign said, uh, it was in some builder's shop, and it said, it said, it's not skill or money that will get this job done, it's perseverance. And I, I found that to be true building my airplane. Uh, I found it to be true in getting the RV-3 done. It, uh, it took a while, it was difficult for us to work, to coordinate and get people you know, all available at right times. But uh, the airplane is made from really uh, four different four different airplane parts of four different planes. And there's enough little design changes and things that have occurred. Everything didn't just fit together like a puzzle. So it, it took a it took a lot of thought and all that. But um, we uh, obviously we, we got it got it done. Uh, you may not realize it unless you look really carefully, but the uh, you know it doesn't have an engine because it's going to be a static display. But uh, one of the guys, I, I was going to build a wooden uh, mount to put the prop in the in the proper position, and one of our one of our chapter members said he said, well hey I'll take that on. Uh, he says but I think I'll make it out of metal. It'll be more durable. So. He took the fuselage, put it on a trailer, took it to his house. And as it turned out, he literally used grandma's bar stool as the, as the mount in there. He, he had, a, had a bar stool that he said had been sitting around for about five years. He had promised his grandmother he would, uh, he would reupholster it. Well, he held the thing up. And he realized with the paper and all that, it would almost precisely fit into the place where the engine mounts would go on the, uh, or where, where the engine would go on the engine mount that was on the airplane. So he called grandma and you know, said, would you mind? And she said, well, you've had it five years and, you, and I still don't have it back, so go for it. So, so we had, there was ingenuity. Uh, if you've looked inside and you see a, a, a panel that looks more modern than what Van would have had in, in his back in those days. Those are coasters from uh, Sporty's Pilot Shop. And one of the guys found those, you know, a uh, set of coasters, each with a, with a, a flight instrument on it. So, so lot, lots of ingenuity was used. Um, we tried our best to replicate the paint job of Van's uh, original RV-3. Uh, one of the chapter members and I went up to, to Van's house and uh, looked at, he has a, a second one of these. The, the original is in the museum at Oshkosh. 
and but he has another one at his house all apart. And we crawled uh, crawled around in there and took measurements of everything to see if we could get the paint design to work the same. And uh, you know, came out seems to us pretty pretty good. The the painting we got the painting and that was we were going to do it all ourselves in the outside the clubhouse on days when the wind wasn't blowing, and that turned out to be a disaster. I mean, we, we tried, and we had blotchy stuff, and, you know, and trying to find a, a day that the temperature was right and, and the wind wasn't blowing. Uh, we ended up uh, going uh, to a shop in Cresswell, a, an auto, auto uh, restoration uh, facility. I had had my, you know, one of my cars detailed there, I knew the owner, and I asked him about it, and they they painted the base coat that white. They did that gratis as a donation to the museum. Uh, we we supplied the paint, but they they did all the work. They painted it white. We we brought it down here, and then the yellow and that was all done with rattle cans, and that's a challenge to make something look halfway way decent. And uh, one of the guys, he's unfortunately not, not here today, and Alan Weaver, he was, he was the artist. Oh, is, is he here? There he is, oh, there he is. Oh, now I'm gonna have to tell the truth. Darn, darn, well, glad to see you. I, I didn't see him come in. He's slouched down and hiding. Okay, well, anyway, uh, Alan did all that, that rattle, rattle canning, and, as project manager, my chief job and during that was to try to keep Alan motivated because he, he'd be working on it. He'd say, "This looks like that, you know." And I, I need to restrip, you know, strip this all off and start over. And say, "No, we, you know, that's not going to work. And you're, you're doing the best with what you've got. And it's going to be fine." <laughs> you know? And in the end, I, I think you come to all agree it is. It's it's uh, you know came out. At least it's nicer, nicer than we than we expected. So um, we got it done, and um, I'm uh, you know very pleased to, as a representative of the chapter uh, to present this to the to the museum, and uh, hope that it'll be you know one of the centerpieces for uh, many years to come. So thank you very much. Thank you everybody for coming. I'll turn it over to Cassie again. Thank you so much, Gary. Uh, of note, Gary has also recently signed on as a project manager once again for the Story Special Number One, which is the sister ship to the Story Special Number Two, the black and orange right out front. Um, those two aircraft raced the first color edition of Sport Aviation, so we're hoping to have those back in the air by the 100th anniversary of uh, Oregon's Department of Aviation in 2021. So that's a good goal right here. <laughs> yeah. um, speaking of our restoration shop, two of the aircraft that Van mentioned today, both the Rupert Special, which was powered by the Salmson engine built by Walt Rupert, um, is in our restoration shop, as well as Wimpy, which was built by Ed Ball and Sweet Ralston, um, and designed by Les Lum, are all down in the restoration shop, which will be open um, after the presentation to take a look at um, for OAHS. There will also be a pilot banquet tonight at 6 p.m. We've got Big Stuff Barbecue from town doing a whole hog for us. $20 per person, 6 p.m. We'd love to have you, cake and ice cream for dessert. Um, I do appreciate and thank you all so much for being here with us today, and thank you both Richard Van Grunsman and Gary, and uh, welcome the RV3 to OAHS. Thank you. Thank you.